Welcome to another edition of Coonrod's Corner, brought to you by the Rogers Corporation. Today's topic, what RF designers need to know about substrate integrated waveguide at millimeter wave frequencies. Now here's your host, John Coonrod. Hello, welcome to Coonrod's Corner. My name is John Coonrod and I am a technical marketing manager for Rogers Corporation. Today I'm going to be talking about what designers need to know about Substrate Integrated Waveguide, SIW, at millimeter wave frequencies. Now this is the second Coonrod's Corner on the subject of SIW. The first one can be found on our Rogers Technology Support Hub and that uh, video is actually more of an introduction for SIW and just some of the basic concepts. This video is going to be an extension of that and talk a little bit more about the practical side of it and some of the uh, variables and things to watch out for in circuit fabrication and in materials and also the design. Shown here is two insertion loss curves, and one of them is for a microstrip transmission line circuit. That's the blue curve, and that is using 5 mil thick RO3003 laminate with rolled copper. The circuit itself is two inches long, and it does have the loss of the connectors included. Now the SIW is the orange curve, and that also has the loss of the connectors included as well. And you can see that there's quite a difference in how these respond over a wide band of frequencies. The wide band of frequencies is going from 10 megahertz to 100 gigahertz, and that's the x-axis. Y-axis is loss in dB. And you can see that the blue curve, the microstrip transmission line, is well behaved across a very wide band of frequencies. And the SIW is behaving as a waveguide should, and it's kind of like a high-pass filter. So at lower frequencies, all the energy is cut off, and then once you go through the 3D, uh, 3dB transition, in this case about 68 or 69 gigahertz, then it transitions into a waveguide mode, and uh, actually more specifically a TE10 waveguide mode. And then that's what it does from about 70 gigahertz on out to 100. Now, I want to do a quick comparison here between three different structures that are commonly used at millimeter wave frequencies. And this is really somewhat subjective, but I wanted to give you the thought process just to think about how these different structures may be used for different uh, applications at millimeter wave. So that's the table of information below. So the first uh, column of information is phase consistency, and SIW is definitely more consistent for phase response than microstrip or ground to coplanar waveguide. And then insertion loss, all three of them are about the same usually. There is a trick you can do with SIW, and that is you can make the SIW thicker, and using a thicker substrate will actually give you lower insertion loss, and there's some other tricks as well. So in theory, the SIW could have the same loss as these other structures, or maybe even a, a little better. Then the range of frequencies, as you can see in the insertion loss curves here, the uh, microstrip is very wideband, and the same with the ground to coplanar waveguide, which is not shown, and the SIW is limited, and that's just the nature of how waveguides work, of course. And then the next three topics, dispersion, radiation, and EMI, it's obvious that SIW is going to be the winner on all those topics, and that's just the nature, again, of how waveguide behaves. And then the last topic is uh, printed circuit board fabrication and the influences of the printed circuit board fabrication on the RF performance for these different structures. So in the case of microstrip, the influences of printed circuit board fabrication and the variables due to the processing has minimal effect on microstrip. It does have a moderate effect on ground coplanar waveguide, and the same can be said with SIW. There are many real life variables to consider when it comes to uh, thinking about SIW at millimeter wave frequencies, and that goes along as well with the other RF structures, microstrip and ground to coplanar waveguide. And just continuing on that topic, I wanted to give another comparison of these three different structures at millimeter wave frequencies and different things to consider about how the material influences can change or alter the RF performance and also how the printed circuit board fabrication variables can alter the RF performance. Shown to the left is a microstrip transmission line circuit, and I've rated uh, what I believe to be the most significant variables in the RF performance, or let's say the consistency of the RF performance. So the, the most important one, in my opinion, is conductor width, and the variation of the conductor width in circuit fabrication has the most significant difference on the RF performance for microstrip. And then next would be substrate thickness, then copper surface roughness, copper thickness, and decay. Now there are exceptions, and again, like I said, this is subjective, and it's really meant to be just a good uh, general comparison between these three structures. But one thing to think about for microstrip is if it is a thinner substrate, which it normally will be at millimeter wave frequencies, 
then the copper surface roughness will have much more impact on the RF performance. So actually item number two and three could swap when it is a thin substrate, which is again typically used at millimeter wave frequencies. Now looking at the middle picture, ground coplanar waveguide, you can see there's many more variables involved uh, that can influence the RF performance and the variables are circuit fabrication mostly and there are a few material variables in there as well. So the ground to coplanar waveguide is definitely impacted by these variables more so than microstrip. And again, the impact I'm talking about is the RF performance. And then finally to the far right is SIW and you can see SIW has much less variables that impact the RF performance. So in theory, you would think that would be the best way to go, and that could be true, but the number one issue there is the plated through hole via location, and that can make a huge difference at millimeter wave frequencies. Just as an example, most of the circuit fabricators can hold the plated through hole via location to a tolerance of plus or minus one mil, and one mil difference for SIW that has a 3 dB cutoff designed at 70 gigahertz will be a difference of 1.3 gigahertz, and that's a pretty significant difference. And that's just a one mil shift. If the tolerance is plus or minus a mil, then you would expect two mils as a worst case range. So in making a SIW and using SIW at millimeter wave frequencies, the designer really should talk to the circuit fabricator very, uh, very often and make sure that they really understand the, the location tolerance of these plated through holes and that they can account for it in their design and simulation. There are obviously a lot of benefits to SIW at millimeter wave frequencies. Now what's most commonly used right now with SIW is normally not the 3 dB cutoff frequency, but actually using in the passband. So on some automotive radar sensors, they're using the SIW at 77 gigahertz, but the 3 dB cutoff is actually much lower in frequency, about 65 gigahertz. So as you transition through the different frequencies, when you get to the point of 77 gigahertz, the SIW is very well behaved for the waveguide mode. It is pretty common for the RF designer to go from a microstrip design to a ground to coplanar waveguide design when transitioning from microwave designs to millimeter wave designs. And there's actually a good reason behind that. And in theory, ground to coplanar waveguide can do a lot of uh, good things for the designer in respect to millimeter wave. And one of them is ground to coplanar waveguide when it's designed correctly will have minimal radiation or possibly no radiation. You can also design it to where you have minimal dispersion and also it's very good for suppressing spurious modes. Now another issue to think about here with the SIW is the transition to the SIW. And most commonly it's either a microstrip transition to SIW or a ground to coplanar waveguide transition to SIW. Now, from thinking about the different fabrication variables that I've talked about on the last illustration, it's probably better to go with a microstrip transition to SIW because the microstrip portion is less affected by the different variables in circuit fabrication than would be the ground to coplanar waveguide. Shown here is a insertion loss curve and as well as return loss curves for two different circuits. They are both SIW based on the exact same material and the only difference is the conductor width is one mil difference for the feed line. In this case it is a microstrip feed line so it's a microstrip transition to SIW and just a one mil difference in the width of the feed line can make a pretty noticeable difference in the return loss. As you can see, there's not too much difference in the 3 dB cutoff or the overall insertion loss, but there is a pretty significant difference in the return loss. So one mil difference on a microstrip conductor width normally is not thought of as a significant issue, but at these frequencies and part of the transition to SIW, this can be a very important thing to consider. This concludes this session of Coonrod's Corner. Thank you for watching. For additional information and technical tools, if you're not already a member, join the Rogers Technical Support Hub and gain access to calculators, technical papers, and more Rogers Corporation informational videos. Rogers Technical Information is also available at your fingertips with the Raj mobile app, available for the iPhone, iPad, and Android devices. Check it out today.